Hi guys, welcome to the Archive. My name is Matt, and this is the Mountain Block System. Caves and mountains look very similar, and in most cases, tiles that will work for mountains will work equally well for caves. Especially big, open caves, like the kind of thing you get in Moria and Lord of the Rings, and a lot of other fantasy cave settings like the Underdark. I do have some other plans for showing tight, confined caves in a way that works well for gaming with them, but I'm going to save that for a future video. The idea with these is simple. Create modular blocks that can be used to make as many different cave and mountain scenarios as possible, and make it compatible with existing accessories and existing systems like the wall and temple system and the magnetic building tile system, and ideally using as few different block types as possible to minimise complexity but maximise the flexibility. Though, if you did want to include more tile types to add more detail, that's definitely something I'm thinking of doing a video in future, so let me know in the comments if that would be interesting. But as a core, this system works great. I've been using it for a few weeks now, and it is incredibly flexible, really easy to build, and is going to work really well with some wilderness tiles that I have planned coming up in a future video very soon. So subscribe to the channel if that's something you'd like to see. One last thing before I start. If the lines between the blocks bother you, don't worry. There is a way to hide them much better than I've done here in these examples. It just takes a little bit more effort at the texturing stage but I'll get onto that later in the video. Anyway, enough rambling, this is how it works. You can assemble these blocks in a ton of different ways, not just stacking them, but connecting them upside down for looming overhangs, and combining them with floor tiles as quick and easy cave walls. I'll be showing more on that in a future video. The core of the system is made up of these four types of block. The fourth type, this angled square block, is pretty optional, but it adds a lot visually. And in most situations, it can be used interchangeably with the main square blocks, so it pretty much made the cut for the core system that way. You can also use pure foam 3 inch cubes to use at the bottom of builds and add height instead of stacking normal blocks for any areas which won't actually be seen, which saves an absolute ton of time and effort. It also gives you the perfect building materials to work from if you decide to make more proper blocks later. You could even make these out of 3 inch square pieces of corrugated card that you can hot glue together to make roughly the same size and shape, for even cheaper. I'll be adding more block types in future, including a flexible and detailed ramp path system, but for now these give you everything you need to show a huge range of terrain. For the most part these pieces just stack but a lot of them have connection slots in various places, which I'll talk about more in the crafting section. Basically though, these work by using a 1 inch piece of cocktail stick with the ends rounded off, which you can use as pegs to connect two pieces, whether they're square blocks that you want overhanging, or sloped corners that you want to place upside down. Also, most pieces can be used with my modular accessories that I usually use on my dungeon and building tiles. You'll see examples of that throughout these upcoming pieces. Even with a fairly small number of blocks, you can assemble a mountain path in a range of shapes and sizes depending on what your story demands. Now I've said mountain path, but really this works perfectly for big cave ledge paths, like the ones that you might see in Moria and Lord of the Rings, and the Misty Mountains in The Hobbit, as well as loads of other examples in fantasy films. I feel like massive fantasy caves like this, 9 times out of 10, have far more in common with actual mountains than with tighter cave systems that look much denser and really completely different. Now if you've built more blocks to show even larger builds, these same paths can have their backdrops extended, or the path itself lengthened for a more epic feel to the fight. If you build enough blocks, you could even have two mountain slopes facing each other, with players and NPCs trading arrows and lightning bolts across the gap, which is just awesome. Another simple build is using the sloped pieces to make sloped connections between two paths. This isn't the best sloped path solution, and you need a small accessory piece to place a model on the slope, but it's a good stand-in until I can get the proper slope pieces made and shown in a future video. These do though have the advantage of being able to show models climbing steep mountain slopes between two paths, which is useful for when your players inevitably decide to do something awkward like that. Sometimes the story will call for a more open area on a mountain, like a rocky plateau, or similar looking area in the depths of a cave. Something like this is as simple as rearranging the blocks and making the slope of the mountain less steep, and showing a flatter but still layered area for combat. These kind of setups are great for ambushes, and having the party fight their way to an objective or escape near the top, 
or as a setup to a boss fight like this frost giant. A really easy way to make areas like this feel like a cave, if that's what you want to use them for, is to attach the sloped blocks at the top as overhangs to show the cave roof hanging in over the edges. With builds where I do this, the idea is to have the walls of the cave facing the DM, so the players have a good view of everything. If I'm using a massive build like this that blocks a little bit of my own line of sight, I tend to just stand up and walk around the edge. It lets me enjoy what I've built as much as my players, and I don't really need to sit behind my DM screen during combat quite as much. And I can still wander behind my DM screen to roll dice or double check some monster stats. Another pretty common scenario is the mountain pass or ravine ambush, where high natural cliffs or rocky slopes on both sides give NPCs perfect hiding spots to burst from as players travel through. Again, areas like this also seem pretty common in fantasy caves, especially in games like Skyrim, so you can use the same blocks and setups there too. Then you've got cliff faces, which can be found pretty much anywhere from a mountain or cave to a coastline. By flipping the square blocks to the right facing, you can show a grid of slots that can be used to show an epic climbing fight, with wall crawling monsters and player characters dangling from their climbing equipment. Keeping something this tall stable was actually surprisingly easy. I layered the blocks in this brick-like pattern and the structure became way more stable. Adding in a spare Amazon delivery box behind it with something heavy put in the bottom and it got support that way too. You can actually poke this build quite roughly and it won't fall over. Job done. Caves and mountains are just the start though. Rocky areas can just as often be quarries, pits or even mass graves that the players end up crawling through for one reason or another. For these pieces the blocks can be used as walls and the slopes make good outward curves when used one way and inward curves when used another way. Then you've got the wargaming standard of rocky formations on open ground which you can assemble in a ton of different ways with these pieces, adding variety and changing tactical situations with every switch. In D&D, these really help make those random encounters in average countryside completely different every time, even with a very limited amount of terrain. And when combined with some tiles that I have planned for a future video, should give you even more options for this kind of wilderness. You can also use these pieces as walls for cave corridors if you wanted to do something like that that adds more atmosphere. I've used some floor tiles here which I'll be showing off in more detail in a future video soon, but essentially you can use the blocks as walls in similar ways as I showed in the quarry example for larger areas. But for tight corridors with a claustrophobic feel, having those sloped pieces push the walls inwards in certain places really helps give an awesome sense of enclosing and gives that kind of natural winding feel to a cave structure. And if nothing else, it's a good stand-in until I get to work on a proper tight enclosing cave system, which I'll do in a future video at some point. Finally, these pieces are fully compatible with the wall and temple system that I've shown in the past, which slots in perfectly to build structures into the sides of these mountainous or cave terrain areas, showing everything from temples, stairs, and sacrificial platforms to entire fortresses built into the sides of mountains. The only real limit is how many bits you build.
And it's also nice and easy to work with with my other modular buildings to show mountainside shacks or even taverns built into the rock face. You're probably spotting a theme here, and that's because building things into mountains is bloody awesome. If you think these ideas are cool and you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, don't forget to subscribe, like, and hit the bell to make sure you see my videos in future. So yeah, these things give you an absolutely insane level of options to play with, which is only increased when you combine them with some of the other modular systems that I've shown previously, and they're also compatible with pretty much anything you've built that requires a flat bottom to place it on, which is probably most of the things you've built. So that's how it works, and this is how to build some for your table. I used 4 inch thick XPS foam for this project, though that was mainly because my new cheap foam supply comes with fuzzy edges that need trimming off. If that wasn't the case, I'd probably just use 3 inch thick foam. But if you wanted to make this project with stacked 1 inch thick foam, you can absolutely do that. If you cut in the right places when texturing, sand it a little and fill any gaps at the end, there should be practically no difference, just a few more steps. Now you can cut through thick foam like this using a craft knife and cutting on both sides and meeting in the middle, but I found that to be a complete pain in the ass, so I decided to just cut through it with a wood saw like I was cutting through a damn tree branch. It's a lot easier and a lot faster, and it does leave a bit of a messy edge, but at the end of the day, you're gonna be trimming this down with a hot wire anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Once you've got a nice strip cut off that's easier to deal with, you can slab it into your hot wire and cut it down to the right size. A nice trick to keeping those nice right angles on this thick foam is to cut off about six and a half inches from one side and then with that piece slam it into your hot wire and cut down a three inch strip off of that. That means that three inch strip is going to have nice right angles on both sides and then the piece you've got left still has a nice right angle for you to cut another three inch strip leaving that waste little bit of foam. If you do this twice on both sides of your thick foam board, you'll end up with half of the board cut down really neatly with barely any effort. Now, getting those nice straight cuts on the middle section that now has saw marks down two sides is a little bit harder, but really not that hard. All you need to do is draw some nice straight lines and cut through it manually with a craft knife or a hot wire. Now, if you make any little wibbles here, that really doesn't matter, especially for this project. Not only are you gonna be cutting down the pieces from this strip into three inch pieces, which means those wibbles will be barely noticeable. Even if they're really, really tiny wibbles, they won't be noticeable because you're gonna be bashing the thing with a heavy rock. So it's going to be hidden by that anyway. Now, when cutting with the hot wire, you might be thinking, aha, I'll cut it with a high temperature. That'll cut through the thick foam better. Don't do it! To some degree, you'd be right. The wire will go through the foam a lot faster this way. However, the wire is also a lot weaker this way and far more prone to snapping, which can be extremely frustrating. I found it was actually better to cut at a low temperature. I only used Mark II on my Proxon and I cut very slowly to give the wire time to cut and not bend too much. Hopefully this will save some people some frustration. Anyway, on to the actual build. I started with 3 inch cubes of XPS foam. I found that unlike in my tests that I showed recently where I cut chunks from the foam first, if you don't cut these chunks, the volume of foam that you lose from caveman texturing with a rock is pretty negligible. I trimmed a thin strip from the sharp edges to make the transition smoother after texturing. This stage is where you have some options depending on your preference as a crafter and the end result that you want as a DM. Basically, you can choose to trim more from each edge, giving a more natural rounded edge. Now, this looks better when the piece is placed on the edge of a cliff or something like that, because it looks more natural. But when you put it up against another piece, especially when you put it up against another piece and look down from the top, you're going to notice a large gap, a very obvious large gap that's only made more obvious by the fact that you've, well, widened it. Now, flat piece to flat piece, that doesn't cause too much of a problem because, you know, you get cracks in mountains and things like that. But when you've got it lined up on a piece like this, like a ledge piece, it becomes all the more obvious and it's something I didn't want on my pieces. 
Gaps here are inevitable, but cutting is going to make them bigger. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is kind of up to you and personal preference. I'm not going to say which one's better, because there really isn't a right answer to that. I then textured the pieces with the caveman technique on all sides, except the bottom to save a little bit of time. Though I did texture the bottom on a few pieces in case I ever needed it to show like on the underside of a bridge or something. The caveman technique involves beating the foam against a nice textured rock to imprint that texture on the foam. It's a good idea to avoid hitting it too hard near the edges of the foam piece though, so it still stays nice and easy to stack and line up. I found the best spots to use were heavily textured but not too uneven so it didn't gouge holes too deeply. I rotated the block as I whacked it to make sure the texture looked varied and not unnaturally parallel. Don't get me wrong, natural rock textures often can be parallel, but to be honest replicating that in a way that doesn't seem obviously artificial is generally just harder than rotating the damn block. I did find that using some of the sharper edges of the rock occasionally to add some slightly deeper lines and varied cracks in the texture made the surfaces again a bit more varied and natural looking. If you have a good bit of texture on your rock but there's another bit sticking out that makes texturing with it awkward, I found that taking a hammer to the rock carefully usually means you can chip away the awkward bits leaving you a better texturing tool. I'm pretty sure the rock that I'm using here is slate from a garden rockery, so you should be able to pick it up from a garden centre if you wanted this exact type of rock. Mine came with the house I'm living in now. You can add to the texture with wirebrush stabbing if you want for a texture similar to the one that I showed from the caveman technique in my stone texture comparison video. I ended up deciding not to do this, mainly to save time on a larger project like this. I do feel like it adds some to the quality of the texture, but only by a small amount and it is fairly time consuming as a process. If it's something that you did want to include in your own pieces, I would ask yourself the question, would I prefer having the visual results of this technique or more pieces to actually use? I added accessory slots on two sides, this one and this one, so they can be rotated and hidden using the blank faces if you want to hide them. Now you can use these slots to connect two blocks together, or you can use them to add accessories like these. Any accessories that I've shown in previous builds that are attached with a cocktail stick, like this gibbet, or this torch, or basically any of the other ones that I've shown. It's pretty much compatible with the whole system. Banners, torches, vegetation, even monsters. Check out some of my other videos if you haven't seen this system. It's pretty flexible. I've got a free template you can download and print off to help make this about 10 times faster, available for free on my Patreon, so check that out if you want to do this section faster. To add slots, I used the template to mark out where I wanted them, and then used a cocktail stick to push in some holes about half an inch deep at a 45 degree angle. Unlike most of my pieces, I pushed in holes upside down as well on these blocks, which will allow me to use temporary inch long cocktail sticks to connect blocks together and remove them again afterwards. On one side I put nine slots, each one inch apart and a half inch from the edges. And because there are so many, I didn't bother trying to hide them. This side is basically the connection side for now and is generally hidden and used to connect to other blocks if needed. But because it's got so many points of connection, it also makes a good climbing wall for vertical encounters if you use my wall crawling minis technique or grappling hook accessories for characters. There's a link to that video that should be above and in the description if you haven't seen it. This side with the nine slots is also crucial to an accessory design that I have coming up in future that adds a ton of playability options, but it also kind of requires these blocks to be a precise distance apart even between the blocks, which is why I've designed them to be a half inch from the edge on each side and an inch from each other. So the holes between the blocks should be an inch as well, in theory. This isn't necessarily going to be absolutely crucial and I'm aiming to design it so that it is not utterly crucial, but it will add some layers of flexibility that you're not going to have if you haven't measured them to be that precise distance apart. Now on the other side, I kept the slots a lot cleaner and added the minimum number that I could get away with to still have the effect that I wanted. You've got a triangle of slots, one at the top and two at the bottom, and then each one has a piece either here or here that gives you some more variety to place two pronged accessories like the gibbet and things like that. 
Basically, this is the minimum number of slots that is gonna enable you to use those accessories, connect to other blocks, but also keep the fewest number of holes in it as possible to make sure that it is a lot more disguisable than the nine point grid on the other side. Now, which side I ended up putting the slot in at the top, I varied from piece to piece to add some variety. You could put it in all on the same side or not put it in at all if you're not bothered about hanging gibbets from it using these slots. But I found that adding a piece on each side added enough variety for it to still look reasonably random even if two blocks were next to each other. I also went to some effort to disguise these ones, which is easier than the other side because they're placed in much less of a grid and there's less of them. To disguise them, I used a cocktail stick to carve in cracks connecting to the holes from nearby bits of texturing where possible, so it all kind of blends together and looks a little bit natural. The trick here is to make the upper edge of any cracks as horizontal and sharp as possible, almost like they're overhanging the crack, while sloping the bottom edge of the cracks to look as though they've been naturally weathered away by running water and rainfall and that kind of thing. It's still a bit more restricting compared to the nine point grid as to where I can put accessories, but I think it was worth it from an aesthetic perspective. I also added the nine slot grid to the bottom of some pieces. I didn't bother doing all of them as this is something that will only be needed occasionally and probably only for a small number of blocks. It can also be added later really easily because the underside won't be painted for most pieces. So don't stress this bit too much. Now that was a lot of description and talking, but really the technique takes literally seconds to do per block when using the template. Because there were so many pieces, I wanted an easy paint scheme that I could bang out en masse and get the job done on time. I started with a coat of two to one neutral gray and tan mixed with one part matte Mod Podge. If your foam isn't gray like mine, you could start this with black mixed with Mod Podge and then do this gray tan mix over it. With the grey foam I find that that's often unnecessary and I can skip a layer of painting which helps speed up the whole process. From there I layered up with dry brushing, firstly with a heavy dry brush of a one part neutral grey to two parts tan mix, so basically the opposite of the base coat which gives an earthier, more natural look to the stone, but also keeps the cold gray in the recesses. For this first stage of heavy dry brushing, I used some of these cheap, but fairly large makeup brushes that you can pick up from any pound or dollar store. They are really useful and you have totally no guilt over throwing them away after completely ruining them by dry brushing with them. I then give a final dry brush of white over both. Where a piece was going to be the same way around, I dry brushed from top to bottom to imitate light. But where a piece might be flipped, I dry brushed in all directions for even more spread. For this second stage of dry brushing, I used an even larger makeup brush because it allowed me to dust on the white almost and give me a really subtle effect. I can highly recommend using different types of makeup brush for dry brushing or over almost any other type of dry brush. Even for smaller things like miniatures, you can get smaller makeup brushes and they make life a lot easier and cheaper as a bonus. Once these were done and completely dry, as in I let them dry for a few hours at least to avoid the wash rehydrating the paint, I gave everything a coat of homemade black wash. If you do this over parchment paper or baking paper, whatever you happen to call it in your country, rather than newspaper, you'll also find any leftover wash pools, which is kind of useful for avoiding wasting any overspill. If you've made this kind of wash before, it's basically the same as the black brown wash that I've used previously, except this time it's pure black ink and no brown. If you haven't made it, it's really easy to make. The mix is just a 60% to 40% mix of water to acrylic matte medium like this Liquitex stuff. And from there, I just add in a few drops of flow improver as well. All this stuff you can find in the equipment list in the description, which if you buy it through those links, will help support the channel completely free to yourself. Once I had that base mix, I added some carbon black ink to add the color before shaking. For a half full 120 milliliter bottle like this one, I used 20 drops. So you can multiply that by how much you're making to get the right amount. I think when I made this later with a full bottle, I used 40 drops, for example. 
I also found it was useful to add marker lines on the side at 25%, 50%, and so on, which I measured just using a ruler. It made it much easier to measure accurately on the fly. Finally, I sealed everything up with a coat of water-based matte varnish that can be used on foam from any distance and is perfectly foam safe. Even if you get right up in it with it, it will not melt foam at all and gives you a perfectly good seal on your pieces. This is a good option for anybody in Europe or in the UK. In the US, there is another option. Both this and the US version that doesn't melt foam are available in my equipment list in the description. So go check that out if you need something like that. Now, before I wrap up, I mentioned at the start that the lines between blocks can be hidden if you take more time at the texturing stage to add more detail. I personally decided not to do this because I preferred the idea of having more blocks to do larger builds than spending more time on an already quite significant project. But if you did want to do this, it is possible and you can hide it. If you do want to spend that time though, you can use some careful craft knife carving to add random rocky shapes to each facing, much like Dwarven Forge do with their tiles. These break up the pieces in random directions and cleverly mask the lines where pieces connect. Whichever options you choose for your own tiles, I'm really happy with how my core set came out. I made 25 square blocks, 7 angled square blocks, 16 sloped blocks, and 12 corner blocks, which gave me a pretty decent amount to play with. You can pretty easily get away with less square blocks if you build some of these blank 3 inch cubes that I mentioned earlier in the video. Or you can do like I did and build 20 of these more and have even more options to play with. I also used my foam stair framework from the Wall and Temple system that I made way back in one of my first videos. Now if you've been watching the channel since then or you've seen that video, you might remember that I said I had plans for that. This is basically part of those plans. Though I do have more. If you wanted to craft a starter set to get using these at the table as soon as possible, you could easily craft half of what I've made here, or even less and still have plenty to use. I'll be releasing another video next week, but that video should be up on Patreon right now. So if you wanted to support the channel that way and see that video early, that video has all of the tutorials on how to make the sloped blocks and the angled blocks and all that other stuff that brings the system together. And I'll be releasing another video soon enough afterwards, showing off more of those floor tiles that you see in this system, but with even more features. Though I may need to take a week's break to catch up on some work for my day job because I still have one of those. Point being, the stuff you've seen in this video is only the start. Anyway, if you need any tools or supplies for your builds, you'll find a link down in the description where you can find my equipment list, which will link to everything that I use and where I get it. And if you buy anything from those links, it will help support the channel at no cost to yourself. That also includes anything else you buy through those links. So if you follow one of those links and wander off and buy a TV or a graphics card or whatever, that's helping the channel too. As always, thank you so much to those of you who are helping make this dream of mine possible by supporting me on Patreon. If you would like to support me in making more of these videos, on Patreon you do get some bonuses like early access to videos and some printables to help in your crafting, like banners, windows and all kinds of cool stuff. So go check it out. That aside, let me know what you think about the system and what you might use it for yourself or any ideas that you might have to use with it. I love hearing from you guys and I can't wait to read some of your comments. Finally, thank you so much for anybody who shares any of my videos in groups. It is really appreciated when you help me out like that. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next week with more Mountain Blocks. Until then, I'll be in the archive.